Hello, I'm Mark Payne with the West Virginia Humanities Council. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the council that brings historical figures to life through first-person portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to both profit and non-profit organizations across West Virginia. History Live is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. They are entertaining and educational. We encourage your organization, school, or event to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Harriet Tubman or Stonewall Jackson come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures. Nothing compares to the live in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts, a monologue, a question answer session with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. Our History Lab presenters have researched a variety of sources such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History Lab presentation is not a play. It's an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Lab presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we'll change the format a little bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give you a sample of how a History Lab presentation can add to your program offerings. There will be information on the screen at the end of this program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Alive character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guest from history. We are pleased to have with us in the studio, Sakakawea. My name is Sakagawea, and my story I believe you will find remarkable. As you will hear, I have endured much hardship, but there has also been great adventure in my life. I was born in the Grand Rocky Mountains, where the wild bitter root grows, which my people, the Shoshone, gathered for food. We also survived on fish and nuts and berries found deep in the mountains, where we lived much of the year, protected there from our enemies, who had obtained guns from men of pale skin that we had heard of but never seen. The arrows of our warriors were no match for these weapons. But every autumn, we traveled down the mountains towards the rising sun to a place where three small rivers come together to make one large river. This was an area abundant in wildlife, including buffalo, which roamed in great numbers. It was during one of these camps that we were attacked by Hidatsa warriors and some of my people were killed, including my mother. Others of us were captured and taken to a village far, far away. I was 12 years old at the time and very frightened and full of sadness for I longed to be back with my family and my tribe, but it was not to be. For the Hidatsas considered me their property and I was to be their servant. It took quite some time to adjust to this new life. I had to learn the ways of the Hidatsas, the customs and the language, the clothing and the food and the shelters shelters made of earth and timber rather than skins. All these were different from Shoshone ways. But eventually I reconciled to my situation and found whatever contentment and joy I could in simple things. When I was 16 years old, I was sold to a French fur trader named Toussaint Charbonneau. He made me one of his wives along with another Shoshone girl and I soon became pregnant. 
It was during this time that a group of men arrived near our village and set up a winter camp. We learned that they called themselves Americans and they had two chiefs, Captain Lewis and Captain Clark. They were on a voyage up the mighty river towards the setting sun to where the land meets the great waters. In the bitter cold month of the bone moon, I began to go into labor, which was very long and very difficult. At one point, Captain Lewis was brought in and he gave me a potion of rattlesnake ring powder mixed with water and I drank it and soon after gave birth to my son who was given the name Jean Baptiste. When the frozen waters began to thaw, the Americans prepared to resume their journey. My husband Charbonneau agreed to accompany them for he had knowledge of many of the Indian tribes that they would encounter along the trail. It was also decided that I would go along to interpret with the Shoshone for horses which the Americans would need to cross the Grand Mountains. So we set off 31 men plus myself and my baby, which I nursed and carried for the whole journey. It would be 16 moons before we would return to our village. We encountered many difficulties. We set out on the mighty river canoeing upstream. We came to a series of waterfalls where all in the party and all of the equipment and all of the boats had to be carried around the river along the bank. We had to make carts out of the cottonwood trees for this purpose. And in this area the ground was very bumpy for the buffalo herds had come and gone and packed the ground very hard and bumpy. There were also prickly care cactus all over the ground which was hard to avoid as we walked and so our moccasins wore out within a matter of days. We also encountered every extreme of weather from scorching heat where we sweated and panted as we walked and traveled and other places in the mountains where the cold was bitter and our hands became numb and our feet became numb. We also encountered heavy, heavy storms of rain and thunder and lightning and also hailstones. There was one place along the river where a storm came and we took refuge under a ledge in a gully and we were safe there for a short time but as the rain began to soak the ground a slide of mud and rocks came down the gully and we practically drowned and were pushed into the river but fortunately we just barely escaped. We also came upon different animals, some which we had never seen. The rattlesnake was uh, found along the trail and, and sometimes close calls happened with stepping on these snakes. Um, there were also mosquitoes at times and 
They caused great misery to all, including Captain Clark's dog, who would howl at night from the bites of these insects. But it was the mighty grizzly bear that most challenged the men in the group. They had heard about this beast. They had been told and warned by the Indians, but they felt that with their weapons of guns, they would not be challenged by this animal. In a very short time, they came to respect the grizzly bear, however, as the mighty beast that it is. There were times where food was scarce. Animals for hunting were unavailable and food that could be foraged was scarce. And we came close to starvation at times to the point where we began to eat things like the candles that the Americans had brought for they gave us enough energy just barely to keep going. There were times where some of us became gravely ill. I, I became ill to the point of death, and I don't have much memory of this, but I'm told by the men that they feared that I might not survive. And my baby, Jean-Baptiste, as well, became very ill and I, I feared greatly that he would die, but thankfully he recovered. The <clears throat> Americans were given roots by the Nez Perce at one point, and because of the hunger, they ate many of these roots and became very ill because they were not accustomed to this kind of food. <clears throat> But all was not hardship. We saw many vistas of great beauty, breathtaking views. I found along the trail roots and berries and spices that I was able to gather and add to the meat of our meals, which was much appreciated by the men. We saw many plants and trees that we had never seen before, and animals. One in particular was very entertaining for the men. They called it a prairie dog. It was a new animal to them, and they made a sport of trying to get the prairie dogs to come out of their holes in the ground. And one day they spent most of the day with this game. We also came upon many, many different tribes that were strange to us. Thankfully, my presence, along with that of my baby, was assigned to tribes along the trail that we came in peace, that this was not a group of warrior men. One of the tribes in particular had a custom of fastening a board to the heads of their babies. And as the baby would grow, the forehead would grow at a slant like a hillside. This was very strange to all of us, but they considered it a mark of great beauty. When we went to cross the Grand Mountains, it was very rough and steep and we lost some of our supplies and it was it was very treacherous and in this area we came close to Shoshone territory captain lewis went ahead and he arranged a council with the Shoshone and i was brought in and very soon, I realized that the chief was my brother, Kamiawait. I was overcome with emotion and ran to him and shook with joy and tears. Eventually, I was 
able to compose myself and translate. And the trade for horses was successful. So we resumed our journey over the Grand Mountains. And on the other side, we found a great river. And this river took us to where the land meets the great waters. <clears throat> we had to set up a winter camp at this point for we could not make it back over the Grand Mountains during the winter. And something very unusual happened. The captains would always tell us where we would set up our camps and assign jobs to different people. This time, however, they gathered all of us in the party and we were each asked to say where we thought the winter camp should be. So we decided in this way, each one with an equal voice. And I felt something then that I had never experienced before. We stayed the winter and in the spring we made our journey back to our village. My husband was paid for his services and I was given nothing, but I know that all things of value are not measured in this way. When my son was four years old, Charbonneau and I took him down the river to Captain Clark's village, which he called St. Louis. Captain Clark had developed a great fondness for Jean-Baptiste, and he gave him the nickname Pomp. He asked if we would bring him down and leave him so that Captain Clark could educate him in the ways of the Americans. So we did that and left him there. We stayed for a while, but Charbonneau longed to go back to trading and the territory of our, of our village. So we went back and that's where we lived. For a time, we lived at Fort Manuel. And while I was there, at the age of around 24, I gave birth to my second child, a daughter, who was given the name Lizette. I felt a great love for her, but also I felt concern. I wondered what her life would be. I hoped that she would be safe, that she would walk freely on the earth to behold many wondrous things. I hoped that she would have a family and friends and a home. And I longed for her to stand worthy and respected in the circle of men. I'm here with Sakakawea of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, and I want to thank you for being with us here today. And my, my first question I want to ask you, you were the only female on this expedition with 30-some other men. Uh, how did that feel? How did the men treat you uh, during the course of your time with them? Um, first, I'll say that um, when I was sold to Charbonneau, um, th this was considered a, a place of honor among the Hidatsas to be married to a fur trader. And he, he did not always treat me well, um, but on the expedition, the men, especially Captain Clark, were very kind to me. Uh, Captain Clark at one point uh, scolded my husband for his treatment of me, which I greatly appreciated. Um, we uh, slept in the tent with Captain Lewis and Clark 
um, while the other men slept in other tents. So generally I felt I was treated very well by the Americans. Now you gave birth just before leaving on the part of the expedition that you were on. That had to be pretty difficult. I mean, how, how, how did you handle that? And was your baby healthy uh, throughout the course of, uh, of the expedition? I felt as a mother to my child that my baby was my biggest job and um, I, I believe that there were times that having my baby is what kept me going. And at one point I became very ill and at another point my baby also became very ill and it was feared that he might die. Fortunately, he survived. But for the most part, he was very strong and did well on the expedition. Well, at this time, I'd like to make it known that this isn't really Sakakawea. This is actually Mary Daly, uh, one of our History Live presenters, who now lives in uh, Green Sulphur Springs. And is that in Summers County? Or, That's in uh, Summers. Summers County, okay. Uh, Mary, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to be here. You're one of our new, uh, or new-ish, uh, History Live presenters, so I want to welcome you to, to that program as well. But I'll ask you what I ask everybody that's ever done the show. What was it about uh, Sakakawea uh, that inspired you to want to learn more about her and research her and, and, and portray her? Well, I have to say that um, in school, history was my least favorite subject. In fact, it was pretty torturous. <laughs> names, <laughs> names and dates and wars and um, that sort of thing, it just I couldn't connect with. Mm -hmm. So as an adult, what I found was um, things like documentaries, historical documentaries, reenactments, um, living history museums, um, really spoke to me in a way that textbooks and classroom, the classroom setting didn't. Mm -hmm. So um, what happened was I watched the Ken Burns documentary, Lewis and Clark, the, the Journey of the Corps of Discovery, and there was enough in that documentary about this woman to make me realize that, you know, what I learned about her in school was just the tip of this amazing iceberg. And I, I, I was amazed at her story. I, I just found all the details hard to comprehend. And I felt like um, shortly thereafter, I saw the notice in the paper about the History Alive program, and I'd never done anything like that. But I thought, gosh, I would love to bring her story to people in a way that would bring her alive. So that's basically what happened. Uh, well, you know, you talked about school, and you know, back in uh, back when I was in school, her name was pronounced differently than it seems to be recognized now. Uh, it was Sacagawea, is what I remember as a kid coming through school, and you know, and how to pronounce her. And now it's Sacagawea. Can you speak to the, the sort of change in the pronunciation of her name, how that came to be? Yeah. So what I learned. Um, in the journals that Lewis and Clark kept during the expedition, they made entries referring to her, and um, her name was spelled two ways in the journals, with a G, a G and with a K, so Sakagawea or Sakakawea. And what happened was, after the expedition, um, when the journals became available, there was an editor that um, published a version of the journals and he changed the spelling of her name from the way it was in the journals to the J. And mm. I guess he did it because <clears throat> um, in, the, in the Hidatsa language there is no J sound, but in the Shoshone language there is. And Sacagawea in Shoshone was a word, a name, and it meant boat launcher. And in the Hidatsa, Sakagawea meant bird woman. 
So I guess maybe he thought he should refer to her in a Shoshone word or a mm -hmm. Shoshone name. So that's that stuck hmm. for a long time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I've also read where she is, uh, Ms. Kakawea is, the most, she, she has, there are more monuments or memorials made to her than any woman in American history. Is that's that, right. Right. That's right. I mean, that's that's sort of amazing when it, you think about it <laughs> is. all the potential uh, candidates for that uh, title. So, right. A lot of mythology around this character. Yeah. <laughs> well, and speaking of which, there are two schools of thought uh, related to her death and uh, the span of her life. One is that she died very early, I guess not long after she came back and was left at her village uh, when Lewis and Clark were heading back east on their expedition or from their expedition. The other is that she lived a long life. What can you tell us about that? Um, the, the written record, there's a couple of references to her dying um, young. One of them by a clerk at Fort Manuel, the, the fur trading post where she was living. She had just given birth to her daughter and soon after that, the clerk wrote that she died of putrid fever. Um, Clark also wrote out a record of all the members of the expedition saying whether they were still living or dead, and that was in the 1820s, and he listed her as dead. However, there's a lot of um, stories and mythology around her returning to the Shoshone and living to be in her 90s. Is there one of the story, one of those schools of thought that you particularly subscribe to more than the other? I mean, any reason that you believe one over the other? Well, I kind of believe both. I believe one as the historical fact, but I also believe there's value in the story of her returning to the Shoshone and living to be an old woman, because it indicates to me the value of her um, identity to the identity of the Shoshone people. So I feel like there's more of a spiritual meaning in that version. So I, I guess I find value in both. Mm -hmm. Well, here in the last uh, minute or so, uh, Mary, <clears throat> excuse me, if someone was interested to learn more about Sakakawea, uh, are there any particular sources that you found helpful and useful while you were developing your character for her that you would uh, uh, refer people to? I think I would, I would recommend that people start with that Ken Burns documentary. Um, there's also a companion book, a quite extensive companion book um, that has many, many resources, um, photographs from museum pieces. Um, a lot of different people contributed to that book and it, it really was valuable for me and it's, and it's very accessible. So I think that's a great place to start. All the information we have about her comes from the journals, and they are available online, but they're, they're daunting, to say the least. So um, if you, it, you, there's a searchable database, however, so you can punch in what you're, you know, the you subject. Sort of Google there. Yes. Or yes, so. Okay. Well, Mary, I want to thank you for taking time with us again to be here on History Live, and thank you for tuning in. Mm -hmm.